Well, I have ended up calling this the Little Green People and Associated Problems. Now, let's start by asking why we are speaking about little green people. And of course, it's simply because we want to avoid racial disputes. If we talk about little red people, we run the difficulty of the American Indians mad at us. If we talk about little black people, we can hit a problem with African-American advocates. If we talk about little yellow people, Asiatic people, we'll be unhappy. If we mention little brown people, Asiatic Indians will be upset. If we talk about little white people, Caucasians may protest. So we need some color not identified with any large articulate racial group. Green is actually a color found in the plant world, so it would seem basically safe. We seldom find people calling themselves green. Kermit, of course, is an exception. You may remember the beautiful song where he spoke about how hard it is to be green. But Kermit is not people. The designation is also traditional. Back in the days when Jocelyn Bell Burnell was discovering pulsars, for which Tony Hewish received the Nobel Prize, but that's a talk for another day, that is in November of 1967, Dr. Hewish and his colleagues called her initial discovery LGM1, LGM2, LGM3, LGM4. They stopped counting after that. That is, little green men one, two, three, and four. Dr. Hewish was acting before political correctness came in. We now would say little green people. You see, Dr. Bell's first discovery was of a signal of a very definite frequency that seemed almost like an airport directional beacon. Dr. Bell seems to have discovered a navigational structure in space. That would certainly imply an intelligent civilization. Soon they realized that something like a rapidly rotating neutron star was a simpler explanation. But the tendency to call citizens of other civilizations little green people was naturally reinforced by that whole event. You could also, if you want, speak of little purple people. Few humans call themselves purple. That whole business of uh, Jocelyn Bell's experiences in making those original discoveries was certainly fascinating. Uh, when uh, Tony Hewish and his colleagues were calling them little green men, one, two, three, and four, of course the press in London heard about this. And when they heard that the person who was making the discovery was a very photogenic young lady, they hurried out immediately to Cambridge. And they took all kinds of pictures. They took pictures of Jocelyn Bell running down the hillside, so stretched across the radio telescope, all kinds of things. And uh, I must admit, she did admit she went along with that, even though she kind of laughs at it now. Well, the next question is this. And this is the important question. And this is rather fundamental. Will they find us or will we find them? If they find us, if they land here on Earth, before we land on their pilot, that action means that they are smarter than we are. Aha. If we find them, if we land there on their world first, that for fact would imply that we are smarter. Our people in the entertainment industry have played with this very, very much. Uh, George Lucas with uh, Star Wars. What happens there is human beings go out into space, and of course, we take our militaristic nature with us, and so it's Star Wars. Our good friend, uh, Steve Spielberg, goes in the other direction. E.T. comes and finds us. Therefore, E.T. is smarter than we are. Therefore, E.T. is pacifist, because smart people recognize that wars are stupid, and they won't do them. Well, human history is not very encouraging 
in studying the meeting of different cultures. There is a tendency for the superior culture to wipe out the inferior culture. Consider the case of uh, Neanderthals. They seem to have dominated Europe in the distant past. Then the Cro-Magnons came along, and all of a sudden, we see very little sign of Neanderthals after that. There may be some genetic remains of Neanderthalers in the current human genome, but not very much. Now, there are no written records to guide us, but it appears that the Cro-Magnons just wiped them out. So we have to plan a bit on how we're going to react if the new aliens are dumber than we are or if they are smarter than we are. We're going to have to plan in both directions. Now, in speaking of a civilization as dumber or smarter, you know, the cultural anthropologists get very upset when you use such terms. I mean simply having a more developed technology or a less developed technology, having made more scientific discoveries or less scientific discoveries. They may, have, may be of equal intelligence, but they may have made more discoveries or less discoveries than we have. The, the peculiar thing is that to some extent, we've all already met this problem because we all in our lives have met uh, students who are smarter than we are. And no matter how hard we study, no matter what we do, they always get a higher grade than we do. They always do better in exams. They always give a better speech. They simply are smarter than we are. And we have to adjust to that. We have to live with it and figure out what are we going to do. Similarly, we have also met students who are dumber than we are. They always get a lower grade. They never answer questions as well. Uh, they don't know how to tie their ties as well. You know, they simply, and we have to adjust to that too. It's kind of something which enables us to start thinking, well, what are we going to do if that event comes when the little green people land or we land there and we find out that they are either smarter than we are or they are dumber than we are? What are we going to do about it? How are we going to adjust to that? How do we uh, kind of understand that situation? In human history, the inferior culture, if it's not totally wiped out by the superior, tends to retreat into the mountains or jungles. Anywhere where the superior culture does not like to live. So if the little green people land and they are smarter than we are and they're really tough to handle, we will find ourselves going to the Amazon jungle. Something like that. Go to some place where they don't want to be. That's one thing. Of course, sometimes the inferior culture simply learns everything the superior culture knows and stands with them. So consider James Joyce, George Bernard Shaw, John Singh, William Butler Yeats. What do they all have in common? They're all Irish, a culture many times defeated by the English but they are towering figures in English literature. That is what we want to imitate if the aliens turned out to be smarter than we are. Then we just simply have to ask them, all right, how did you handle quantum entanglement? We can't do it, can you do it? You know, and try to learn everything that they know. I'll let you try to work out how we should act if we are smarter than they are. Now let's consider some problems for the religions of the world as we start traveling around the universe. The first most interesting question is the fascinating situation of sacred space. Consider Islam. Islam has as its credo the five pillars of Islam. The second of those pillars is that the adult male Muslim a very macho society still, the adult male Muslim, is to pray five times a day facing Mecca. Every mosque has a little indentation in the wall that tells the faithful the direction to Mecca. It's called the Mirab. The direction to Mecca itself is called the Qibla. But where is Mecca if you are on Mars? 
Mars rotates on its own axis, revolves around the sun. The Earth rotates on its axis, revolves around the sun. Perhaps what we would have to do is the Martian mosque might have to be placed on a rotating platform. A computer program would then determine where Mecca is at every moment. Such a rotating mosque might be easier to construct on Mars since the gravity there is considerably less, and so a, a good steel could, could do that sort of thing. When we move beyond Mars, the problem because, becomes much more difficult. The fifth problem, the fifth pillar of Islam is the Hajj, the obligation of each adult Muslim, if possible, to make a pilgrimage once in a lifetime to Mecca. Will that hold for Muslims born and raised on Mars or in any other location? Interesting. The Hindu tradition is tied closely to the country of India, almost to the soil of India. It has also a special concern for the moon. What happens on Mars, which has two moons, both small, that rotate visually in different directions across the sky. Hmm. The Judaic tradition has a special reverence for Jerusalem. In former times each year, the Seder meal at Passover ended with the statement, next year in Jerusalem. But Jewish thought had developed an independence of Jerusalem since they were excluded from that city for so long, so it's not really a tremendous uh, problem for them. Next is the question of sacred time. The adult male Muslim is to pray five times a day facing Mecca. All right, but what's a day? Hmm. Muslims have already met that problem. One example was when a Muslim Saudi prince went to the space station. There the day is 90 minutes from sunrise to sunrise. You're going to pray five times every 90 minutes. I mean, you, obviously this won't work. I believe he settled the problem by going to the Grand Mufti in Cairo uh, to get a solution for that. All of the religions of the world will have to struggle with sacred place and sacred time. They will also have to figure out who has the authority in their religion to make the decisions necessary to adjust to the new situation. Who's going to tell the Muslims what those five pillars of Islam are if you go out to a moon of Saturn? And now, do you face Mecca? Or if you don't face Mecca, what do you face? And who decides that? And what is the day going to be? And how many times during the day? And who decides that? It's an interesting question. It's kind of especially interesting because Christianity has no such problem. There is a famous uh, discussion between the Samaritan woman and Christ at the well in Samaria where the issue comes up, and that's in the Gospel according to St. John in the fourth chapter. You may remember that is one of those very dramatic interchanges that uh, St. John uh, loved to create. And so uh, uh, our Lord has been walking for quite some time. The apostles have left him. They're going into the village to pick up some food to eat. He stays by the well there. And it turns out there is a Samaritan woman there. Well, he's been walking all day. He's thirsty. And he asks the Samaritan woman whether she has a cup so she can, he can get some water from that well. And of course, she's baffled because uh, men don't talk to women in that society except under special circumstances. We see that's still going on in those sections of the world. And uh, then an interchange goes back and forth. And uh, finally, our Lord does that crazy statement. He says, uh, uh, well, we can go further, but why don't you call your husband? And she says, uh, well, I don't have a husband. And he says, well, yeah, that's true. As a matter of fact, you've been married five times. And the person that you are with now is not really your husband in that you told the truth. Well, now, of course, the, the Samaritan woman is very smart. Anybody who's been able to handle five men has to be very smart. And so she immediately says, 
I see you are a prophet, sir. My Samaritan ancestors worshiped God on this mountain, but you Jews say that Jerusalem is the place where we should worship God. Jesus said to her, believe me, woman, the time will come when men will not worship the Father either on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans do not really know whom you worship. We Jews know whom we worship because salvation comes from the Jews. But the time is coming and is already here when the real worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And so that's the statement, a very strong statement, that there is no sacred place in Christianity. A Christian may, in the course of a lifetime, visit Jerusalem. It's a wonderful idea. If you possibly have the chance to do it, you certainly want to do it. You may also have the chance to visit Nazareth and all of the sites in Galilee. If you possibly have the chance, it's wonderful. You can understand the Bible much better if you do. In fact, they frequently talk about the land of Israel being the fifth gospel, the thing which really enables you to understand the gospel when you see the places where everything happened. But you don't have to. If you want to, it's wonderful. It's a very good idea, but you don't have to. You can visit Rome if you want, <clears throat> and you can go to a papal audience. And it's a good idea, particularly with Pope Francis. You don't know what he's going to say next. <laughs> and you may want to be there when he comes out with, with another statement. But you don't have to. There is no sacred place in Christianity as a result. So if we move to Mars, or we move to some uh, moon of Jupiter or Saturn, or we decide uh, to leave the solar system, build a big colony that is self-supporting and go off out into space. I mean, we're doing it now with our satellites. Our satellite has left the solar system. Uh, is that Voyager 1? Voyager 1 has gone out of the solar system and still very happy, it's very, very, very having fun out there. So it may happen. So there is no sacred place in Christianity. And actually, there is no sacred time either. For instance, when is Christmas? Well, Christmas celebrates the birth of Christ. All right, when was Christ born? Good question. How do we settle that? Oh, we have it all worked out. We have a sacred congregation of rites over in Rome. And it is already set up. If you want to know Christmas is where Christmas, when Christmas is going to be, if you move to Mars, you just ask the sacred congregation of rites and it will come out with a rescript right away and it'll be settled. We even have the authority structure in place uh, to handle it. How interesting. The next to final point is that Christians already have the command in the Bible to go to other places. If you go to the so-called long conclusion to the Gospel of St. Mark, now let's take a look at that. So the long conclusion to the Gospel of St. Mark. And there, that's chapter 16, verse 15. And you know, just to be dramatic, I'll give it to you first in Greek because it's rather important what the Greek words are. Okay, what is that being, what is he saying? You get it translated in a variety of ways. And he said to them, going forth to the entire world, preach the gospel to all peoples. But that's not what he said. That's not the Greek. That's why we have to go back to the Greek. He said, go out to the whole, and he doesn't use the word gay, which is earth, or anything like that. He uses cosmos. Go out, keruxitai, peruthentes aistan cosmon hapanta, going out to the entire universe. The cosmos, the entire developed world in which we live. It's already there. Preach the gospel, and it doesn't say to all men or to all people. He says to all creation. So we already have a command from Christ 
to move out. And this has happened over and over again in the history of Christianity, and it's fascinating to study. And each time it caused a bit of a crisis. Each time it happened. You may remember in the uh, Acts of the Apostles, there's a situation where the Roman centurion Cornelius comes to talk to Peter to ask about this new religion. But Cornelius is a pagan. Peter is not supposed to talk to those people. He's certainly not supposed to go with them to their home and go into their house. That would make him impure, technically. So you can't do that. And you remember the story is told that Peter has a dream. And in the dream, something is lowered down from heaven, which is filled with all kinds of animals. And he's told, rise, Peter, and eat. He says, oh, no, I don't do that. That's not kosher. And the voice says, look, don't call anything that God made impure. And the thing goes up again. And it comes down again. So three times. So he's trying to beat it into Peter's head. And right at the end of that, there's a knock on the door. And it's Cornelius. And he says, gosh, I guess I'm supposed to talk to him. I guess I'm supposed to talk to him. That's what the vision was all about. And of course, he does go to talk to him. And everybody in Jerusalem, the, the original community, gets real upset with Peter. Why did you do this? Why did you do this? And he tells them the story. And they say, well, I guess maybe that's what the Lord wants. The moving out from one culture to another culture. It's a, it, was, it has happened over and over again. And it has always been greeted with a certain amount of opposition and, and you know, backlash. One of the other very famous ones. St. Paul is on his trip through Asia Minor. And he gets over to the coast, the Aegean Sea. And he's going to turn south to go to places like Ephesus and places like that, which he finally would go to. But that night he has a dream. And in the dream, a Macedonian appears to him and says, come over and help us. And Paul wakes up and he says, obviously, I'm supposed to leave Europe. Leave Europe? I mean, leave Asia. Leave the continent of Asia. Go out of Asia. Go to a new continent, Europe, a different continent, to a people that are pagans. They're not even Jews. They're nothing. But they have asked for help. And so he goes across. And you know, you have the epistle to the Philippians, to the Thessalonians, to the Corinthians, that whole experience that, that he had there. And it happened again and again. You may remember our good friend Christopher Columbus. And Christopher Columbus came over to what we used to call the New World. The Indians, always sort of American Indians, they always kind of look at us and say, what do you mean the new world? We've been here for 30,000 years. Well, all right. At any rate, that, but they did meet what we call the American Indians or the indigenous peoples. And the meeting was not very happy for the indigenous people. For instance, we have that whole section we call the Caribbean. And why do we call it the Caribbean? Well, because that's where the Carib Indians lived. How many Carib Indians are there? Now, that wasn't completely deliberate. That was because they didn't have the immunities to the diseases that the Europeans had. So the Europeans brought over diseases, and the indigenous people didn't have immunities to them. Of course, you may remember that they paid us back because the first recorded um, epidemic of syphilis is in 1495, after Columbus came back from the, uh, visiting the New World. So it looks like there was a, a bad exchange there. Um, and then there was a very famous <coughs> fight that occurred, because the Spanish were a more advanced civilization than the indigenous. That is to say, they had more technology. They had guns, things like that. They had horses. Right? And therefore, they figured they had a divine right to enslave the indigenous people. You may remember that a huge fight broke out on that. Bartolome de las Casas, the famous uh, Dominican bishop, fought very hard against that idea. And there was a famous debate over in Spain with uh, 
Bartolome de las Casas and Father Sopebira, and Sopebira hoping and holding the position that the Indians were not quite human, and therefore it really was an advantage to them if they were taken over and controlled by the superior European civilization. And uh, de las Casas said, this is nonsense. But you can see it's happened over and over again. If we do land on Mars and the people, the little green people come and they wiggle their antenna at us, um, you know there will be a question, should we preach the gospel to them? And people will say, how can you preach the gospel to them? Uh, they're, they're not one of us. They're, but we've been through that before. We will argue about it, but the answer will always be yes, because that's what is really implied in the gospel, uh, the gospel word. That's what we're supposed to do. That's the nature uh, of what we are. Well, a final point. The universe is a very big place. I mean, it is really very big. I mean, you know, it is really, really, really big. Our earlier paper showed us that there are many planets. And it looks like, as we look further and further, there are many planets. I mean, many, many planets. There must be some of those, as it seems, that are about the size of the Earth and in an Earth-type orbit. And therefore, there must be intelligent life on them. Moreover, the Earth is astronomically very young, four and a half billion years old. That's the age of our sun, more or less. So there must therefore be civilizations out there that are considerably older than we are, even if only 100,000 years. And therefore, they must be vastly more technologically developed than we are. They must know radio, television, technologies of all kinds. People always ask, well, are you going to be able to talk to them? And the answer is, of course, we always can talk to them one way or another. You know how to do that. You can start this way. One, two, three. Now, if I say, Uno, dos, tres. You can get what I mean right away. You don't have to know the language. So we can communicate with people one way or another. All right. So they must know all such things like radio, technical matters, and like that. But then we have an interesting question. And the interesting question is, where are they? Why can we not detect them? I mean, we can do all kinds of things with our technology now, and we're increasing it more and more. But we still have not found any hint of life elsewhere in the universe. You may remember that this question was famously asked by Enrico Fermi, and so it's called the Fermi paradox. If intelligent life is all over the place, why can we not? detect it. And there are all kinds of answers that you can give to that. One answer that Fermi used was, well, maybe they know how to do it, they know space travel, but they're not interested. Not possible. I mean, it's like telling us that we not to go to, to Mars. I mean, you know, a lot of people say, don't do it, don't do it, no. but you know we're going to do it. We can't help it. it. It's what we are. It's what we are. It's what life is. Life always expands, it always moves out, goes further and further. You can't not do that. Other would, people would say, well, maybe interstellar travel is too expensive. So it's so expensive that no civilization is willing to spend the money. Bah. We spend money like water. Washington does it all the time. It takes us a trillion dollars to do it. Bah. That's one year's de federal deficit. We can handle that, so that's not it. Um, so we are kind of a little bit baffled as to why we haven't been able to discover life so far. The unhappy sort of thought that 
that also could be brought is maybe technological societies self-destruct. We actually are at the point where we could destroy ourselves. Atomic bombs won't do it because they're really too small. But hydrogen bombs are getting there. Hydrogen bombs do not have a size limit. They can be of any size you want, and you can make anything you want. In We could do that. And we might do it not by atomic weapons, but how about some of our biological experiments? If some experiment goes wild and some little creature escapes from the laboratory, maybe technological societies have a limited lifespan and self-destruct. But you know, we don't believe that either. I mean, maybe a pessimist might say that, but we really think we're kind of smart. We're not totally smart. If we were totally smart, we would not be engaged in war. I mean, war is, you know, really counterintuitive. If you believed in evolution, you know, would you do this sort of a thing? You believe in evolution, would you take the absolute best specimens you have, perfectly healthy, right at the time when they should be going out and having families and raising children and kill them? That's what we do in war. That's what war is. It's counterintuitive. And so we real, realize that, and we keep saying it, but we do it anyway, but a little less, a little less. Maybe atomic weapons are helping us in that because they scare us from a full-scale war, and we back away from it all the time. But that is one of the other solutions. Maybe intelligent life simply self-destructs. I don't believe that. And therefore, I have another solution. <clears throat> This is a little wild, but why not? We know that life on Earth began once and only once, and in only one place. Well, we think we know that because there is only one type of amino acid which naturally occurs in living systems. But in the laboratory, there are two types. So if life had started in a whole variety of places, you would get a mixture of amino acids, some formed in one way, some formed in another, and we don't see that. So if life started in many places, there would be a mixture It's not there. From that one place, life spread across the planet. It's everywhere now, in the oceans, in the skies, tops of mountains, in the middle of glaciers, everywhere. And maybe that's the model. Life begins on only one planet, ours, but then spreads out across the universe. We've had 12 people walk on the surface of the moon so far. And remember, we have time. That's the one thing we have. For instance, if you say, to get to Mars, can't do it right now. Don't know how to do it. I mean, it's too dangerous. We don't know how to control the radiation effects of a long voyage in space. Can't do it now. All right, all right. Give us 10 years. We still won't win. Give us 20 years. Give us 100 years. Give us 500 years. We have it. We can live for 500 years. The human race, I mean. And so therefore, some 100 years from now, we'll go to Mars. A couple of hundred years after that, we'll take a look at Venus and say, say, you know, that's a nice planet. Let's terraform it. Let's make it into an Earth. Can't do that, can't do, well, we can't do it now, but it's only a technical problem, and it's a technical problem within our technology, our ability, even at present, we could start doing it. And in 500 years, who knows? But we have the time. You say it's going to take us, the, uh, the uh, Voyager 1 to get to the nearest star is what, 40,000 years? You say, oh, we can't do that. What do you mean? What's 40,000 years? All you do is make a large space station, large enough to handle, say, 20,000 people, self-contained, and off you go. In 40,000 years, you're in another star. In another 40,000 years, you're in another star. And you know, in 100 million years, you'll be throughout the Milky Way. In a billion years, you start going to other galaxies. It is simply that life starts here and it's going to expand. Now, all of that, of course, gets turned on its head 
the minute we get a signal from another intelligent civilization. But that is my own feeling. So if you were to ask me, is there intelligent life in the universe yet? I'd say, yes, it's on Earth. And given a little bit of time, it is going to be everywhere because that's the nature of life. And so, as I always tell my students, what that really tells us, and it's an interesting conclusion, is that history has only just begun. History has only just begun. Thank you.